Our second scripture reading also comes from one of Paul's letters to the church in Ephesus, verses, chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of God's glory, God may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. Thanks for that image, Amy. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to God, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To God be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. And all God's people said together, Amen. We are in a time of transition. We are amidst in our own church a pastoral leadership transition. We have installed or not installed, we have nominated and put in, in practice Heather and Patrice as our interim pastors before the interim pastor. We have an interim pastoral nominating committee looking for a new pastor. We are in a time of transition. We are transitioning to summer. The summer solstice was just this week. Kids are done with school. Vacations are perhaps beginning to happen in a way they haven't happened in some years. In the pandemic, we move next week into the courtyard for summer worship. We've already transitioned into the 10 a.m. one worship. And we are still also in transition from this pandemic. As I named earlier, my colleagues Heather and Sarah are not here today because they had a COVID exposure. We pray for them. And we're coming out on the other side of that pandemic, out of isolation, out of living life at a slower pace. We're grieving losses of lost life, of missed milestones, and yet we're still wondering and working at what we want life to be like on the other side of this past two years. We experience that in our families, in our churches, in our schools, our governments, and in our economy. And we are in a time of constant and continual cultural transition it seems like and it seems in light of this week's events it seems dark sometimes discouraging and painful but to borrow from activist Valerie Kaur perhaps this darkness is not the darkness of a tomb but the darkness of a womb Perhaps we are in transition like women in labor, where hope and new life is emerging and it may be difficult, but we breathe and push together in this time of transition. So as I was reflecting as where we are as a church and where we are in our culture in these time multi-layered spaces of transition, I felt drawn to reflect with you this morning on these two prayers that Paul prayed for his two churches that he deeply cared about, that he helped get started, and that he longs to see flourish and grow just like that flower that Amy gave us a beautiful illustration of this morning. And at the heart of both of these prayers for the church in Philippi and the church in Ephesus, I hear a resounding desire on Paul's part as their pastor to experience the revolutionary depths of God's love. And I know that word love, it can be so trite, so overused, right? But this love, Paul says, overflows. It roots us and grounds us. And again, as Amy so beautifully illustrates, it's unmeasurable. It has breadth and length and height and depth that surpasses 
knowledge. When you think about these images in Paul's prayer, how do they strike you as you think about love and God's love? Do they resonate with you? Do they seem too good to be true, too lofty, just big theological words? Do they stir up a longing in you? I, I desire that kind of love. I wish I knew that kind of love. Or maybe even resistance. It's not possible for that kind of love to be true. Whatever you notice in yourself, just be with that this morning. I want to focus just on this one verse in 18 for a few minutes in chapter 3 of Ephesians. Paul says that we might, he prays that we might have the power to comprehend the breadth, the length, height, and depth of love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. I don't often go into the Greek words when preparing for a sermon, but this particular Greek word, I wondered, what does comprehend mean in the Greek? And when I looked it up, it's this beautiful Greek word, katalambano. And I remember my, my Scottish professor, Andrew Purvis, at Pittsburgh Theological saying, Seminary, saying that word with his Scottish brogue, katalambano. It has a more aggressive sense in the word than, than just comprehend. It has connotations of to grasp hold of, to make one's own, to obtain and attain, to take into oneself and appropriate or even seize and take possession of. It's a very active and gritty and intense word. I pray that we might have the power to grasp hold of to make our own and seize the breadth, length, height, and depth of the love of Christ. That surpasses knowledge. It's beyond knowledge. God's love we cannot measure. It is beyond knowing in that intellectual and rational sense. The anonymous 14th century author of the book, The Cloud of no Unknowing, puts it this way. God, whom neither humans nor angels can grasp by knowledge, can be embraced by love. For the intellect of both humans and angels is too small to comprehend God as God is in God's self. Rational creatures possess two principal faculties, a knowing power and a loving power. No one can fully comprehend the uncreated God with knowledge, but each one, in a different way, can grasp God fully through love. God can only be embraced God can only be katalambanod through love because it surpasses knowledge and intellect and understanding. We can only grasp God through our loving power. Comprehending God's love can only occur through the power of love reciprocated in humanity. Author A.W. Tozer says that most of us who call ourselves Christians have substituted theological ideas for an arresting encounter. We are full of religious notions, but our great weakness is that for our hearts there is no one there. Troubling words. Tozer describes this kind of love relationship with God as an intercourse between God and the soul that can be known in conscious personal awareness as certainly as we can know material things through our five senses. It happens often when I'm sitting up here and listen to the children's sermon and I think, that's better than what I'm about to say. <laughs> Amy did such a beautiful job to say, love is unfathomable. We can't measure it. It can only be directly experienced in relationship. So I ask you some questions this morning. How do you know that God loves you? How have you experienced the love of God in your life? 
Where in your body, mind, or spirit do you encounter the love of God? When do you notice it happening in your life? And perhaps when was the last time you perceived or felt the love of God personally? Because love comes to us and love is inherently relational. And so it demands a response. God's love is constantly being given out into the world to each and every one of us individually. It sustains the world like a water wheel, constantly giving life and love into the world. And God says, what's your response? when you notice it, when you feel it, when you experience it. And God is w awaiting our response. And so this is why Paul prays that we might have power. This requires some effort on our part to take hold of and seize that love that is beyond ideas and knowledge and intellect. A response is needed on our part. For this knowing is not simply opening our minds and taking it in as information. It is a knowing of mutual invitation and influence, of knowing and being known and rooted in intimacy and connection, an invitation that demands a response. If we are to grow in love, experience love's depths, and have love overflowing in our lives, we must essentially give God permission to accompany us, to know us and to be with us. It's kind of like floating in water. Anybody remember those times of beginning to swim or teaching a child or a niece or a nephew to swim? You can't float unless you stop trying to float. You have to put your full weight of the body into the water. We can only float when we stop trying to do so. We float when we trust that the water will buoy us and hold us. We can float when we stop becoming uh, so self-aware of what's above us, what's below us if we're in a lake or a river or the ocean, and trusting ourselves to the water's care and holding power. This, I believe, is what it's like to encounter, surrender, and overflow in God's love. What is your experience with God's love? This water buoying you. Is it safe? Secure? Trustworthy? What keeps you in your life swimming, moving, striving, trying to float? What keeps you looking up and around and below you, wondering if it's safe and secure? Even when the water of life seems white-watered, chaotic, perhaps like we felt this week, dangerous, do we trust the love of God in Jesus Christ to carry us, to support us, even when the water is stirred up and there are foaming white-water rocks? to not let us down and take us where we need to be? These are the real moments, are they not, of transformation when life seems out of control, when we are at our worst, our anger is right at the surface, our fears are blown up, our nervous system is fully engaged, we are activated, and we have to ask ourselves, is the love of God strong enough, trustworthy enough to carry us in the midst of it. Anybody ever been whitewater rafting here? What are you told when you get in the boat and if you fall out of the boat, right? Don't stand up. If you fall out of the boat, trust the flow because what happens if you, potentially happens if you stand up, your foot will get caught in a rock and the power of the white water will begin to wash over you. Times of transition are these spaces where life feels chaotic, overwhelming, tiring, confusing, and it can be hard and is hard for us to tr trust that love is indeed guiding us. And yet, it's exactly at these moments of vulnerability. I don't know how you feel about the transition that we're in in this church. I don't know how you feel about the transitions that we're facing on the other side of the pandemic and in our culture but they feel vulnerable to me. But it is in these moments, 
where, we, where I would say we most often need to get to that place of desperation, that place of emptiness and brokenness, that place where our knowledge can't figure out the way forward. We must seize hold, surrender to God's love, trusting God's goodness towards us. And our knowledge can actually get in the way. Because knowledge, when we feel like we know, it gives us a sense of control and mastery and it keeps us in charge. But surrendering to the booing love releases control enters in unknowing, into the unknowing space of our lives and trusts the one who is love to guide us and direct us. Living in this way is hard. It takes practice. It takes self-awareness. And it takes vulnerability. Perhaps one of my all-time favorite books in the last decade of my life there's a book called Surrender to Love by psychologist David Benner. And he says this, The key to spiritual transformation is meeting God in vulnerability. Our natural inclination is to bring the most presentable parts of ourselves to the encounter with God. But God wants us to bring our whole self into the divine encounter. God wants us to trust enough to meet perfect love in the vulnerability of our shame, our weakness, and our sin. Tragically, most of us have large tracts of our inner world that are excluded from God's transforming love and friendship. It is like going to the doctor for a checkup and denying any problems and focusing only on the parts of oneself that are most healthy. Transformation occurs when we bring all parts of ourselves into the banquet of love provided by our divine host. Our fearful, angry, wounded parts of self can never be healed unless they're exposed to divine love. This is why we must meet God's love in our vulnerability and brokenness, not simply in our strength and togetherness. I don't know about you, but I need someone like Paul to pray for me, to have the power, the courage, the strength to lay hold, take into myself that unfathomable, unmeasurable love of God. Because it is higher and deeper and broader and wider than I can imagine. And perhaps that's Paul's point with his prayer, where it ends. When we are most vulnerable and choose to trust and take into ourselves the divine love, it works upon us. And Paul's closing line, it is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. So friends, as we live through this season of transition as a church, as we live through this season of cultural transition, let us courageously bring all of who we are, especially the parts of our lives and the parts of our church that are broken, messy, and vulnerable. Let's bring it all into the presence of God's transformational love so that God can accomplish in each of us and in the collective us abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. May it be so. May it be so.